Hello and welcome to the Vicar's Watch Dibley, the podcast where real priests talk about pop culture and what we've learnt about faith, life and the church. We've watched Dibley and now we're watching everything else. I'm Kate. I'm Ruthie. I'm Margaret. And today we have replaced Ross with Margaret. Uh, she is a priest over in the Episcopal Church in the States and I met with her recently to do a funeral and so we've invited her on to talk to me and Kate about the ordination of women, uh, especially with the celebration of 50 years of women being priested in the Episcopal Church and 30 years of women being priested here in the Church of England. So we hear some of her story and the story of the women who paved the way over in the States. Well, a holy happy hello to you all. Hello. Hello. You may have been uh, already been able to tell from our introduction and from the voice that we have replaced Ross with a rose. In fact, <laughs> we've got Margaret Rose has come to join us today, who uh, you may remember from the podcast a while ago. Uh, I talked about her giving me her stole and, and things like that and the funeral that we did together. And we've got her real life in person via video to um, talk to us today. So thanks for coming on, Margaret. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Yeah, so we thought we would talk today because it's been the anniversary of 30 years of women being ordained in the Church of England, but America were ahead of us and uh, it's 50 years of uh, women being priested, isn't it, uh, over in the States? Yes. Yeah. So uh, we thought we'd find out a bit of your story of how you got ordained uh, and then uh, we're going to talk a bit about a film called The Philadelphia Eleven that you were telling me about and uh, we'll we'll post a link to the trailer and stuff um, in the description. But Margaret, you're ordained, aren't you? You're a vicar. Yes, I am, though I'm not sure you would call me a vicar in the United States, and we'll talk about that in a minute <laughs> for the moment. Yeah. I, I currently work for our presiding bishop uh, on the staff there and have done so for the last 20 years, though there have been three different presiding bishops. We don't call them archbishops, really, in the United States, but in the Episcopal Church. Mm. Um, the presiding bishop and my official title is deputy to the presiding bishop for ecumenical and interreligious relations. Uh, more about that. Uh, but I was a vicar. Um, I was a vicar yeah. in the long past, and I was ordained in what we might call uh, the second wave of women uh, being ordained in the Episcopal Church. That is to say, I, I was ordained in 1981 as a deacon, in 1982 mm. as a priest. So it's been quite some time. The Philadelphia yeah. 11 that you talked about uh, were ordained in 1974. So that's the 50 years. We'll talk about that in a minute. But should yeah. I say a little more about my own sort of personal journey that direction? Um, maybe before, we, before you continue, just for our listeners, yeah. some of whom are from the UK, some from the US, some from other parts of the world. Could you just help us um, understand what's the difference between the Episcopal Church and the Church of England? Well, we are all part of the Anglican communion, let us say. And, uh, you know, we have a wonderful relationship with the Church of England. But let us just say that uh, back in 1776, we had a little revolution in the United States. <laughs> and um, it, as a matter of fact, uh, what happened uh, was that uh, the church in the U.S., um, of course, could not continue to be the Church of England because we no longer had or wanted a king. And so we had to figure out something uh, different. And uh, for a while, there was uh, sort of a, a, a very unclear moment there until the church itself decided be, to become the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America. We've since changed our name from that somewhat, uh, as in just the Episcopal Church. But we did a lot of uh, work to have bishops who would uh, help to ordain us. And that happened because of the generosity of the church in Scotland. 
Um, and there's a long history there, but the Episcopal Church is one of the many churches uh, which is uh, part of a different province of the Anglican Communion. Our polity is the same. We have somewhat different prayer book, uh, as in we have a book of common prayer, but we do not, for example, pray for the health and uh, uh well, we pray for the health and salvation of all leaders, but we pray for the president of the United States and not the king of England <laughs> or the king of queen. <laughs> There's more there, but I, I think you get the picture. Yeah. But polity-wise, you wouldn't really know the difference in, in terms of going to church. Probably polity-wise in terms of ordination and the election of bishops mm -hmm. and our recent general convention in Louisville, Kentucky, um, which happens only three years, is a different kind of governing mm -hmm. governance. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So tell us about your story of how how did you feel the call to ordination? You know, what made you decide to get collared? <laughs> Good question. Well, I, I should say I'm one of those people who never in a million years uh, wanted uh, or thought it was a good thing to be ordained. Uh, not not <laughs> that we shouldn't have ordained people, but I didn't think about it in terms of me. Um, I grew up in the rural south of the United States in Georgia uh, in the Episcopal Church. So I and as you know, the U.S. is quite a pluralistic country, more and more so in terms of religions, but always uh, in terms of many denominations. So there mm. it was never an established church, the Episcopal Church. It's one of many. And uh, so I grew up in this small church where my family were very active, but I uh, also attended a Baptist church and a Methodist church, which wherever the good kids were, I was there. And um, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to be a part of, of whatever that uh, community group was, but I, we were very faithful Episcopalians in my whole family um, as well. But I was always a seeker. And when I went away to um, university, I did major my, my, I studied French and also um uh, religion and biblical studies was my major. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it sort of just was because that was an interesting thing to study. And um, my the reason I sort of got into the ordination process was through um, a scholarship called from the Rockefeller Fund. You know, the Rockefellers were these rich, this rich family, but they were very interested also in uh, theology and leadership, and in particularly in the leadership of minorities and of women. Mm -hmm. So I got a scholarship to uh, study theology um, on the um, premise that I would consider the possibility of ordination. And so oh, okay. um, I thought, well, I'm safe. I, I don't have to do, I don't, because it hasn't been voted in, in favor yet. So sure, why not? So I applied for this scholarship <laughs> um, and was accepted. And before I was in any ordination process at all, I went to Harvard Divinity School and um, began my my studies there. Um. Mm -hmm. The what happened to sort of inch me toward this consideration of the possibility was that I was in that first year particularly miserable and figured I really had wanted to work in some social justice work. And I, I was working in a battered women's shelter and I had thought of myself as a glamorous lawyer, somehow helping the world. And uh, it, it became clear to me that um, I, as I continued at divinity school, that that, that wasn't going to help me be a glamorous lawyer in any way, <laughs> shape or form. <laughs> So, so I went to see the dean of this divinity school, who was a wonderful man named um, Christer Stendahl. Some of you may have heard of him. He later became a bishop in the Church of Sweden, but he was the dean of Harvard Divinity School and a very uh, big ecumenist. And he said, I, I know what you need. And I was ready for the answer to that. He said, you need to spend a semester in Switzerland at the Ecumenical Institute of the World Council of Churches. And I said, absolutely. 
I, I had spent very left field though. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I'd spent a year in Paris in, in France and I'd love to travel. And I thought, yeah, I, I, yes. And, and this is an institute which is still going today. I recommend it to anyone interested in the least in ecumenical work. Um in outside of Geneva. And uh, so I did go there for a semester and the scholarship uh, followed me along there. And um, just to say quickly about that time, um, this semester, at least then, the, um, the title of the academic work was Church, Power and State which was right up my alley and trying to think about justice and the church. And I always wanted the church to be related to, to what good things might be happening in the world to be peacemakers, et cetera. So I, I went to this Institute. There were many, there were 65 students that semester from 35 different countries. You can imagine a rural Georgia woman uh, coming to a place of <laughs> such amazing diversity and we all arrived with this great idea that um, we were we were all going to love each other without measure because didn't we love Jesus and Jesus loved us and um, we wanted to live together in harmony. And I think that lasted maybe um, for maybe two or three days. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so, so and and many of these folks had been in uh, in ministry ordained and were already in um, in pastoral ministry and in political ministry from all over the world. So I I think I was 27 at the time. Uh, I I was sort of. Uh, confused but delighted about the conversations. But as we tried to work out the, I mean, the arguments were political arguments, the arguments were pastoral arguments, the arguments were like, oh no, you women, you cannot be going to the bathroom in your bathrobe. You've got to get dressed every time you go out of your room in order to go to the joint bathroom or no, no, oh, we gosh, men are okay. not going to wash dishes <laughs> or on and on. It just Theologically, you know, the Germans thought we were all soft and the French thought we weren't philosophical enough and the Africans <laughs> were pretty sure that the Americans weren't political enough. And it was just, it was, you know, it was very, very, um, uh, there's a lot of animosity in those those first few weeks, but we all said, wait a minute, we, we got to do something here. We're, we're here for the next six months. So we began to say, what does worship look like? in our desire to be together. What we were already sort of going uh, every morning to, to sort of morning prayers, but, but we decided as we spoke together um, to come together in worship and to put our judgments aside at that time. Now, we did, a, we did a lot of planning when we went to this to chapel every day. And no, we were not able to share Eucharist. The Greek Orthodox were not going to share Eucharist, even with the Roman Catholics then. And we, yeah. we, there were, we didn't share Eucharist, but we shared a commitment to prayer. And we shared this commitment to trying to understand one another and trying to listen to one another. And for me, I, I suddenly saw the connection between sacramental worship, whether or not it's the Eucharist, you know something about that, Ruthie, with bread and breaking bread <laughs> together. Um, but, but we suddenly saw that, that we could be together and work together for common purposes, first of all, without having to agree on many things. But also that common purpose was for the healing and transforming of the world and not so much just for our desire um, to even be good priests or pastors or put our churches forward. But it was something way far outside the walls. And for me, that was a moment in which said, oh, religious actors can be peacemakers. Christians can be peacemakers. We have a call. We are impelled um, as uh, I'm impelled by my faith to do something that change that however small it is, that maybe can change the world. And maybe I can best do that through this holding of the sacraments and through my own sort of sacramental presence. 
So I went back um, to Harvard Divinity School, which at the time, of course, was not a very not very focused on ordination planning. This is a university divinity school. And I um, spoke to um, the bishop in Massachusetts where I was at the time, or I spoke to the to folks and began the ordination process. Um, and what did that look like for you in the set? What kind of things did you have to do as part of it? Right. So I went back. Uh, this was not so such a smooth process when you went back, because, of course, I think in your situation and now very much in ours, you're not supposed to start studying all these theological things without having spoken to somebody to say you wanted to be ordained. Um, so, you know, I sort of came to it at the end. But I, but I did speak. Um, I, I considered um, I went to speak to the bishop in Atlanta for a lot of reasons. That wasn't the right place. That was Georgia. but. Um, the, by this time, the ordination of women had passed, um, not only with the Philadelphia 11, who we'll talk about later, but also through our governing processes, um, the ordination of women was affirmed in 1976. So yeah. I, um, the Diocese of Massachusetts, where I was located and where I had been studying, was, um, was quite open to women. And I went to um, speak to the bishop and they said, well, great. Let's, let's see. I went through a discernment process in a parish yeah. and the parish then recommends you to the commission on ministry. Um, oh, right. Okay. And then you have um, requirements through the commission on ministry who then name you as um, a postulant for holy orders and then continue various studies. Now, I have to admit, I had to do a sort of uh, Episcopal polity uh, course afterwards, even though I'd finished the divinity studies, even though I'd yeah. been in the Episcopal church all my life. Um, and then <laughs> I was um, ordained in the Diocese of Massachusetts in uh, 1981 as a deacon and 1982 as a priest. Um, I did not have a terrible time in that that period right after, but there were many, many women who did. And, and there was a lot of conversation about if, uh, whether or not those amazingly strong lay women were now going to be sold out by, um, the women who then got ordained and somehow thought of themselves as, or got co-opted, uh, by the sort of male hierarchy and, and patriarchy. Yeah. So it, it was, but for me personally, I, I say this often, it, it wasn't an easy road, but I think at that time I was a highly educated white straight woman. And so they said, huh, yeah, maybe, maybe this will work. <laughs> so I, I'm just aware, <laughs> I'm aware of that privilege um, that yeah. I, that I sort of went into this with at that time, which was very fraught for women in the Episcopal Church in this second wave um, because of our beginnings, which had been those of civil disobedience. So when did when were women deaconed in the Episcopal Church? Oh, you're I, I that was sometime before that was I, yeah. I should be if you watch the Philadelphia 11 11 film, you'll know exactly. And if mm -hmm. I could Google it right now, I'd tell you, <laughs> I'm trying to think it was maybe 1968 or 69. Okay. So there were women deacons in the Episcopal Church well before. But that, that's not the right date. And I should know it. But but I don't. So <laughs> there had been women who were who were ordained and um, who ordained to the diaconate by then already. Yeah. So because we had women, didn't we? Hey, you're be a better historian than I am, so you can tell me when I'm wrong, which is probably immediately. But we had women that we kind of weren't deaconed, but we recognised some of their calling as part of it. So they would kind of like be parish assistants kind of thing. But Deaconesses. What? There was a separate order of deacons created yes. with deaconesses. Correct. Yeah. Um, we had exactly the same thing. And there have been, oh, right. in fact, I think there's one uh, deaconess 
uh, who is still alive, who was a deaconess, who chose not to become Mm -hmm. a deacon. And in the Episcopal Church, in this date that I can't remember and that I'm looking up now, um, the, <laughs> our our general convention, I guess like your synod, um, voted to have deacons, uh, those who chose uh, to become uh, uh, deaconesses, sorry, who then could become uh, deacons. Right, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just so they were... I just did a quick Google, and the first deaconess license in Church of England was 1862, Elizabeth Catherine Farrard. Wow, 1862? 1862, it's a lot earlier than you think, but this is a completely separate order from the deacons. Um, So when I was ordained, there was um, a woman who decided to remain a deacon when she was ordained, um, but that is different from the order of deaconesses um yeah so and of course within the anglican communion um women have been ordained uh since world war ii with lee tamoy um in Hong yeah Kong. yeah yeah we, we just did a service and i know you have in england at saint martin in the fields a service celebrating the 50th anniversary of her ordination mm. yeah. also canada or, ordained women mm-hmm. before the episcopal church yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, there we were certainly not the first at all. Yeah, and well, you were faster than you were us. Faster than we are, <laughs> and there are still parts of the Anglican Communion that don't ordain women. Um, so, do our yeah. listeners, if you want to donate to a charity which promotes the ordination of women and the training of women, particularly in those countries which are less supportive, there is the Lee Timoy Foundation. Um, I can't oh. can't talk about her and the ordination of women without promoting. Uh, they particularly they sell a specific breed of. D- dahlia um the flower um, oh. which you can buy uh, to raise money which is yes. the, the Florence i was convinced Lee-Tamoy. you were gonna say dog or goat or something yeah. like that i didn't expect you to say flower but that makes a lot more yeah. sense yeah. Than... <laughs> absolutely yes oh we we are a part we support the Lee Timoy foundation mm. also and the, mm. it really crosses the the um the diocesan synod and geographical lines in wanting to support the amazing work that the, the ama- her amazing courage, mm-hmm. I think, in, yeah. in the midst yeah. of what was not so easy. Yeah. So, yeah. You've hinted about it a bit and uh, 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 about these Philadelphia 11. So tell us a bit about these rebellious women. <laughs> Right. Well, I'm glad we had the the deacon conversation, but um, because uh, the Philadelphia 11 women who were the first uh, women to be ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church um, were 11 women who all were deacons Um, for the year. Our governance body meets every three years in something called general convention and for um, two or three conventions, the ordination of women had come up for a vote and been voted down. And it was voted down uh, for the last time in 1973, I think it was. I'm not sure exactly, 73 or 72. And um, Many women already were deacons, so there were women who were who had done all the requirements to be ordained to the priesthood, but uh, we had not passed this hurdle. So after the final negative vote, particularly two of the women, Sue Hyatt and Carter Hayward, said, we're done here. We, we need to organize, um, as Sue Hyatt said, we need to stop asking permission to be a priest, but to be a priest. And they began to organize and, and doing some research on the women who might want to say yes to an ordination uh, sort of outside the rules of uh, the general convention. They were also very um, connected to a number of bishops. And so um, as the year went on, they there were 11 women who agreed to go forward. And there were three bishops who agreed uh, to do the ordinations. 
uh, if you see the film, The Philadelphia 11, it will give you much uh, better pictures and all sorts of ways of seeing that film, uh, by the way, in your very own churches, even in the Church of England. Um, but um, after a lot of discussion, uh, the 11 women were all white women. And they were they were diverse in every way in terms of age, um, sexual orientation, uh, experience. They, but they'd all been they were all deacons and they were all white. So they were just so aware of the racial justice issues that were happening uh, in the U.S. at that time. Um, and they asked around who might be willing uh, to do this uh, to, to what church might be willing to do the ordination. And uh, Father Paul Washington, a priest in Philadelphia, African-American priest, uh, said, come to the Church of the Advocate. And the Church of the Advocate had been very involved uh, in uh, the civil rights movement here and um, saw this also as a civil rights issue. So they were ordained on July 29th. Um, 1974 at the Church of the Advocate in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, the, the crucifer at that service was a woman named Barbara Harris. Barbara Harris at the time was a lay woman. I believe she worked for Shell Oil Company. And she is the African-American woman who became the first bishop in the Anglican communion, who was a woman. And her story is, is not told so well. Uh, it, it is not in that Philadelphia. I mean, she's in the Philadelphia 11 uh, movie. Yeah. She, she tells her story. Uh, she also was an amazing woman. She died just recently. Uh, but she then, she was a bishop in Massachusetts. Wow. So gosh. Barbara Harris, Google her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 she sounds amazing. Gosh, so this wasn't authorized, was it? It was just they rebelled and went, enough is enough. We're called to be priests. We're going to get ordained priests. Yes. And so were the bishops who did it, were they uh, part of the Episcopal Church? Were they Anglican bishops? Uh, they were Episcopal bishops. Right, okay. Let us say, they were <laughs> Episcopal. Oh, yes. This ordination was completely and totally by the rules. The only difference was the women were women. The people were women. It was It was as yeah. if, as if that could have happened. Uh, it, the year before, five women presented themselves to be ordained at an ordination, at an actual um, planned ordination in the Diocese of New York. And Bishop Paul Moore, who was a very liberal bishop in favor of the ordination of women, nevertheless said, I cannot. So right, they, were, okay. they were not ordained. So they were ordained by the rules. Now later, um, so they were... Um, as you can imagine, the bishops were um, quite upset at this uh, infraction. And the bishops themselves were um, censured for not for doing this. And yeah. they had some of a couple of them had trials, um, all of that. What there was wow. a special called meeting of the House of Bishops, which was just after this. Um, and uh I can't remember exactly what the next step was, but they had they told the women not to um, celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, mostly they didn't. Some did. It, that's in the story of the film. And then um, yeah. in uh, Minneapolis, our next um, general convention, uh, the ordination of women passed. And so these 11 women were what they called regularized. Um, so they, they were called, they were called valid, but irregular. Um, oh. so the, <laughs> these 11 women were, were authorized in the meantime, there were also four women in Washington, DC who were ordained a year later. So, so it was clear, you know, that the, the horse had left the barn and, and yeah, yeah. this, this was going to happen. So, yeah, um, it, it's, oh. 
having having our beginnings be as revolutionary in a certain sense Mm -hmm. as our own sort of national beginnings um Mm. i i think says something about who we are as a as a church uh with all of its complications that's for sure yeah yeah Yeah. and do you see any parallels in um so there's a group of catholic women um who are sort of in that same way they're just going ahead with organizing ordinations i think um the most memorable is the 2002 seven women ordained on a cruise ship um do you think that then yeah. that is you know in, inspired by the philadelphia 11 or um do, do you think there's parallels there in how the holy spirit is moving I definitely think there are parallels there. There's no, there's no question about that. I do think that the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church is a much more powerful entity mm-hmm. than uh, than our sort of various autonomous bodies in the Anglican mm-hmm. Communion. Um, and I, I do know a couple of churches who um, who welcome the women church services and have mm-hmm. been to a couple of those. One notably in Rochester, uh, New York, and there's some. There's one in St. Louis. Um, so I, I think the 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 amazing thing that's happened in the Roman Catholic Church with women, I think, has been there's been this ordination um, track and women going forward in amazing, amazing ways. And there have been also these amazing and powerful women who have chosen not to take that path, but who continue to be as radically working for justice within the church, um, you you all no doubt know that, and and mm-hmm. I think those those are sort of powerful powerful ways that um, that the Roman Catholic Church has worked on um, uh, the empowerment of of women and their ministries, mm-hmm. ordained or lay or however they are. One thing you talked about, Margaret, when uh, you were over here, we chatted a bit about how. Within the Church of England, we ordain men who disagree with the ordination of women. And so we have something called mutual flourishing that enables, hopefully enables, uh, both parties to flourish. But that's not the case in the Episcopal Church, is it? Not not so much. Let me say that um, our bishops do have quite a bit of authority. And if you um, if you are a person who is... Um, blatantly against the ordination of women, you would not make it through a discernment process. Um, We did have for a while something called a conscience clause about the ordination of women, uh, but that is no longer the case. Um, So so while I said it's not the case in in the U.S. or in our diocese, Mm -hmm. there, there are certainly ways that people might get around that and still be ordained without um, right. without being in favor. Of, uh, you know, there's a diversity there, but there's not a mutual flourishing thing about the ordination of women. We're struggling uh, now still in some ways around um, the ordination of LGBTQIA folks, but we are moving in the direction yeah. of always mm-hmm. making sure that if a person gets through the discernment process, they may be ordained, perhaps not by the bishop where they are located, or that that um, same-sex couples may be married and that the bishop is responsible to find a place where that is possible. Uh, see, we haven't quite managed that one yet mm-hmm. here, but the whole living in love and faith process continues on. And uh, we've just had Synod here, so there's been more discussions about that. Oh, did you see we might get more time off, Kate? Oh, yeah. They, yeah I saw. They're staying about 36 hours instead of 24. Woo! So <laughs> Which is exciting. actually a backtrack, because there was a previous synod, synod where they talked about two full days. So, <gasps> you know. One and a half. <laughs> We'll have to get that well, instead. I saw the Senate, the Senate information. There was a news article in our um, Episcopal News Service. Uh, tell me what changed at this Senate, where you moved forward. 
Not around Don't time anymore. Good question. Oh. It, was, oh. it was a very good question. Um, and I think not much at all. Um, I think there was lots of discussion, but I don't know if there were any major decisions made. Maybe I'm wrong. I know. I've not looked into it as much. So Ross, who is a host with us, used to be on Synod. Uh, and since he moved to his new role, he hasn't um he's stepped down from Synod because he's in a different diocese now. Uh, and so can't be on Synod anymore. Mm. So if Ross was here, he would know. Yeah. But we just bumble along and then when we're told to do things, we do things. Yeah. He's our <laughs> he's our general synod correspondent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, going back to our roots, Vicar of Dibley, that's where we started from. I believe you are aware of the Vicar of Dibley, Margaret, and I was telling you about um, what's she called? The Minister of Minister Divine, Divine yeah. which was, yeah, which was the pilot that was done in, in, in America. Uh, what are your thoughts on Vicar of Dibley? Do you like it? Well, I talked to your daughter quite a long time about it. <laughs> Let me say yes. Um, I do, but I am not nearly so knowledgeable um, as you all are, or as my daughter Hannah is, who watches British TV from her uh, perch in Boston, Massachusetts, <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, and I, yeah. I, mean, I, I love the ways that we can talk about, uh, just especially with humor, what it means. Um, to engage the church in in the lives of all of us and are engaged to, or or have perhaps every seminarian should see the vicar of Bibli and, and several or, or perhaps should listen to your podcast on it to engage those <laughs> questions. I'm, I'm you know my as I told you my main uh, British I don't watch television very much. But I, you know, regularly watch um, Call the Midwife. <laughs> but I will go back for the to the vicar as well. Ah, oh, Call the Midwife is great. I was watching yesterday and it was another episode that I was like, this would just be brilliant for the podcast. Mm -hmm. We should just become a Call the Midwife podcast because it's just so full of faith and belief and hope and, ah, oh, it's brilliant. So... Whereas I've been rewatching Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I oh, thought, oh, that one too. The first episode <laughs> is a brilliant one to talk about reluctant calling. Um, yeah, um, yep, yep, one to to, to fulfill, fulfill your calling. I, I know this is going, but I, I had a parishioner, and she watched Buffy the Vampire. Mm. She was a psychotherapist. She watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Slayer every week, and she would come to church and say, "Here's what they did this week, Margaret. Mm. Here's what happened." <laughs> <laughs> It was great. It was great. Mm. Amazing. Um, what, what we've sort of, after Vicar of Dibley, we've transitioned more to talking about just general faith and film and the things that we, uh, taking popular culture as a springboard to talking about faith. Do you have any sort of cultural touchstones or pieces of media that you refer to? Um, I would say the answer to that is, that's a yes. And I say that because I think that um, in, I've, pretty sure that in your deacon's ordination you have this too but in ours it is to tell the needs of the world to the church so my my first go-to is what's happening in the world what's happening uh in on the beach down the street from my house how are people interacting with one another what what do i see today that is that is a that I can think theologically about and that could make a difference in uh, the sermons I'm preaching or the engagement I have with the church. Um, I also um, am a regular reader of something called the New Yorker magazine and in particular the New Yorker cartoons and New Yorker fiction. Um, and I, I think that the conversations um, that are happening about, about the world today um, are the essence of our work uh, in the church. Uh, I'm also, our, our church also has an office of government relations, which I'm very involved with because it's part of the team that I'm a part of. And, um, and we are also looking at the touchstones of our congressional uh, and political life. How do we advocate um, 
not just as the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church, because as I said, I'm the deputy for ecumenical and interreligious relations, but how do we do this with our partners? How do we do this with Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Jews and other Christians of many other denominations? So, so my, my job, to my delight, is, is always to look outside the walls and try to interpret that for what's happening both um, in, in, say, small communities and small parishes, as well as um, in, the, in the larger context. So I, I'll follow that maybe. Is that okay, Kate? Yeah. Um, just to say, I was recently um, at the installation of a young friend of mine at the, her installation as the parish priest uh, in a parish on Long Island. This parish is a merger of two parishes because, of course, um, not unlike you in many places in the West, our churches are some, in some ways smaller and smaller, at least uh, those who come inside the walls. But this particular merger also included a giant garden. And uh, the church itself works uh, and has its church services on Sunday, and its ministry during the week is to work in the garden with folks who come to church, folks who don't, and to sell it, sell their goods and give them away from time to time at the local farmer's market. And I was really grateful that the, the bishop who came, I think we often are afraid, or, or I hear the words from church leaders sometimes, that we are becoming uh, to our detriment, an increasingly secular society. And I don't think, I think there are very fluid lines between secular and sacred. And we, our job is to see the sacred in everything and to know that there are all sorts of places where um, the Holy Spirit is working and where there is a possibility of something new. And if we try to say it's only in one place or another, I think we've got it wrong. So I think there, there are fluid, fluid lines here around uh, the world today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Margaret, for speaking with us today. Um, as we draw to a close, um, do you have any words of wisdom or encouragement or hope for anyone who's exploring a call, whether to ordination or to something else in their lives, particularly um, as we think about with Philadelphia 11, if they're in situations where what they feel called to be or to do isn't uh, uh, an encouraging situation for them? The first thing I think from our conversation is, um, on the one hand, to take the church lightly. That is to say, um, don't expect uh, the church to always do it right. It's a community, it's an institution, and institutions are structures which help us to, to gain some solidarity and some ability uh, to build community. And, and I think that's, that's one thing. And another thing I ask myself often, which our previous presiding bishop, Catherine Jefford Shorey, um, preached in her, verse, her very first sermon. I can't remember the text exactly, but um, the question she always asked herself and invited us to ask is, what would you do if you were not afraid? What would you do if you were not afraid? I love that question because it doesn't say, are you afraid? Of course we're afraid, we're terrified. What would you do if you were not afraid? And I think that helps us, or that helps me anyway, um, to, to imagine what might be possible and then to go forward with it. It doesn't mean that, the, that it's always gonna happen, but to keep that question going for us and, and to believe, at least for me, the other thing, people are always asking me, oh, well, tell me about your prayer, prayer life or leaders sometimes. And I was like, I pray without ceasing. And one of my prayers is to ask myself that question and also to answer it and to dare to move forward with it. I have um, one more question, though. It goes back to Vicar Dibley. And the reason we talked about 
The reason we talked about Vicar Dibley is because it was the only kind of touchstone icon that we had who was a woman priest uh, when we were growing up and, and seeing stuff on the TV. This was the woman vicar that we saw and just wondered if you had anyone who was like that kind of uh, as you explored ordination and and uh, who were your kind of examples that you grasped onto? Well, by the time I started exploring the ordination part of this, um, I, I think I had those Philadelphia 11 women, even though they were not so much, some of them were not so much older than I. But I, I also, um, my father died when I was, quite well, I was 15. And my, we were in a very small Episcopal church. He had been very active. Um, but my mother became the first senior warden in that church. And I, I, I'm sort of flummoxed that that came to my mind when you asked that question. But, but she became not a sort of activist kind of leader. It was, you know, it was back in the early 70s, um, but it was natural for her to be a leader in that that small church. And the priest there, um, who had formerly been a journalist, um, first of all, encouraged my mother. And then when I went, who was a man, and when I um, went on that exploratory uh, way toward um, ordination, he was right there with me and and was a person who, when I was ordained, sent me yeah. his um, chalice and patent and said, these are mine, I give to you. And then in my first job, I, I had a, a wonderful Aww. woman who had been previously a nun who was, um, his name was Jean Sprout, uh, on the cathedral staff who were just right there again supporting, as well as uh, the dean of the cathedral, who um, who really mentored me in so many ways. So I had some wonderful men who mentored, as well as wonderful women. Well, thank you, Margaret, for coming and talking to us. I'm sorry if my uh, internet has misbehaved with the recordings, but hopefully that just means you two have had a nice chat as <laughs> part of it as well. Um, and thank thank you so much for asking. And I'm glad I was home. And I hope it works out. And also for the work that you all are doing. It, you know, it truly gives me hope for the church. It gives me Aww, hope. Yeah. Thank thanks. You. We like doing it, don't we, Kate? We do. It's fun. And as long it as we fun. have fun doing it, we'll probably keep doing excellent, it. Excellent. Excellent. We're not really success focused. <laughs> uh I will leave a link to the uh recording of the um we'll leave a link to the film of the Philadelphia 11. Uh, so you can at least see the trailer, even if you can't find anywhere nearby to show it. Um, but it's, uh, it sounds a really fascinating film and I've loved the little insights and stories that you've given us mm -hmm. as part of it. We are, it's really hard to do this without the camera on because we normally pick up on each of the <laughs> signals in order to do it. But uh, we hope you've enjoyed uh, uh, listening to us talking about the journey of ordination for women in uh, over in the States in the Episcopal, Episcopal Church. And uh, you've heard our stories already here. And we are really grateful to you, Margaret, for taking time out of sermon writing to come and talk to us all the way over in New York uh, uh, to tell us your story and the stories of these incredible women. What a pleasure. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Vicar's Watch Dibley. Thank you to Nat for editing our ramblings. Any opinions expressed are our own and do not necessarily reflect reviews of the Church of England or any other organisation with which we are affiliated. If you like our podcast, leave us a review, follow us on social media and share it with your friends. And, as always, bless you for listening. There's a church in the city of New York, let's say, that was doing quite a lot of construction, but it was always open for prayer, for people coming in, for silence or whatever. And so um, there was a woman who came regularly uh, to pray in this church. And one particular day, uh, it was the time of stopping of the construction. So one of the workers uh, saw this woman coming in and said, I'm just going to go up to the balcony and I am going to scare the life 
out of her. She came in as she usually did and knelt in prayer in the silence. And suddenly uh, a sound came which said, hello, this is Jesus. And the woman just keeps praying. She's perfectly fine. And the construction worker thinks, well, did she not hear me? So he's a little louder this time. He says, hello, this is Jesus. Nothing from the woman. She's quiet. She's praying. She's deep in prayer. So again, he just says, hello, this is Jesus. And she stands up and turns around, looks up and says, won't you please be quiet? Can't you see I'm trying to talk to your mother? <laughs> <laughs> One. That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs>